Good morning. Um, I was really blessed by the worship service so in the song. So thank you so much, worship team, for leading us into God's presence. And it is my joy and my honor to be with you this morning. I bring greetings from South Los Angeles, where I've been living with my husband and our three kids. And we've been serving and ministering there for the past 20 years. Um, this is a most recent picture of our family from senior night. Our son is a graduating senior, and um, it's a little surreal, so senior night for basketball. Um, but we had the honor and privilege of being on the planting team for a covenant church that was started in our neighborhood. And we actually have two of those members from that team as well, Jeff and Amy Blaine, who were here, which is super special. Um, 20 years ago, and the vision that God gave our team was of a cross-class, cross-cultural, parish-based focused ministry. So we designated one square mile in the densely populated neighborhood um, just uh, west of USC, if you know the area, and that was our parish. And we all lived there in that square mile area, and we focused our ministry efforts there. So whether it was through Bible studies or prayer meetings or elementary school tutoring or youth ministry, we sought the Lord and we sought the holistic transformation and well-being of our community. Unexpected to us, in our years of ministry there, we discovered that there was an active oil drilling site right there in our parish where uh, there was open air um, pumping of thousands of pounds of toxic chemicals under the ground into pipes underneath our homes, all that 15 feet from where people were living. So, you know, open air facility on one side of the wall, workers are in hazmat uniforms, and on the other side of the wall, kids are just on their little scooters running around playing. Uh, there have been many ups and downs in our ministry, as oftentimes in ministry, but especially in a community with a high poverty rate. And the Lord has been so faithful in carrying us through many uh, struggles and disappointments over the years. But at the same time, uh, we've seen God move mountains. Um, in these last years, in a miracle that only the Lord could have brought, our community successfully pushed the city of L.A., to enforce the same protections at our drill site in our neighborhood that had been afforded to drill sites in West LA 20 years prior. So instead of open air activity, there had to be full enclosure. Um, there had to be um, conversion instead of diesel pumps drilling, there had to be electric drills so all the diesel fumes wouldn't be out in the community. Um, there had to be an on-site uh, uh, air monitoring system, which had not been in place. And so the city basically ruled in our favor. Yes, these same protections in West Los Angeles should be enforced here in South LA. And so the oil company, you know, fought that. There was a whole appeals process. The Lord prevailed. Um, the enforcement stayed. And so the oil company decided it is no longer profitable for us to do business in this community. So um, the, the property is currently in the process of being cleaned up. Um, Redeemer Community Partnership is the nonprofit, kind of the sister entity to our church. And the Lord provided funding for them to buy the property. And it's currently in the long-term process of being transformed into affordable housing and green space, which is what our neighbors, as we polled our neighbors, everybody voiced was a priority. So we are still celebrating God's goodness there. In these recent years, my husband and I transitioned from our pastoral roles in the church, and we have stepped into some new roles with a Christian missions agency called Servant Partners. And we had already been on staff with Servant Partners, and our church was a partner ministry site for many, many years with Servant Partners. And now with our new roles, we are supporting uh, staff who are doing what we were doing, but in other cities, of other urban poor communities, both here in the U.S. and around the world. With the rapid urbanization of the past decades, 
The urban poor communities and cities around the world have been exploding in size and in number, and the Holy Spirit has been at work. He's been creating communities of Jesus followers who are learning how to be agents of change within their own marginalized community. And Christians of different races and ethnicities are both sharing their faith and organizing their neighbors in finding ways to break the cycle of poverty. So it's been a beautiful and exciting time. When your pastor reached out to me about the possibility of speaking today, I was especially drawn to the theme, the topic he already had planned for today. And I know you're making your way through your series, uh, Christian Essentials, and reading the book together. And I cannot think of a more fitting essential than Jesus' call to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're going to spend a little more time in the passage that the chapter opened up with. So if you, you know, read your chapter before today, you're already um, ready for that. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to pray for us. Jesus, thank you for the gift of being here today with my brothers and sisters. Thank you for your spirit's presence that is here with us, for waking us up this morning giving breath in our lungs, life in our bodies. And as we look at your word together, please breathe your spirit in us. Open our hearts to hear you speak to us. Please meet us in the ways that only you can. In your name we pray. Amen. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now this passage comes on the heels of some intense interactions Jesus has been having with the religious leaders. At this point in Matthew, he's already entered Jerusalem on a cult on the day we commonly celebrate as Palm Sunday, he's already set his sight on the cross and the road ahead. All that happens in chapter 21. And since then, the religious leaders have been questioning his authority. And he's been telling some pretty incisive parables. And they know, the religious leaders know, that Jesus is calling them out in these parables. And they decide they want to find a way to arrest him. But they're not sure how to go about doing that because they are afraid of the crowds. And the crowds see Jesus as a prophet. In verse 15 of chapter 22, it talks about how the, the Pharisees try to plan a way to trap him with his words. And they try to trick him to say something that they could report to the Romans to have him arrested. Their trick doesn't work. And Jesus' wisdom leaves them dumbfounded. Another sect of religious leaders, the Sadducees, come that same day to question Jesus. And Jesus, again, responds with profound wisdom. And the Sadducees have nothing left to say. Which then brings us to our passage, which is the third questioning interaction in the series. And after this passage, after this third and final question, the chapter closes with Jesus turning the tables and asking the religious leaders his own question. And as they, as they respond and then he responds, they then have nothing else to say. I wish we had time to dive deeper into these chapters, but we don't. But I encourage you, sometime this week, you could read Matthew 22 and 21 to go deeper. See if you can unpack why Jesus calls out their hypocrisy in the following chapter, in chapter 23. So with this third and final question we have this morning from the religious leaders, the Pharisees are still trying to find a way to trap Jesus. And one of the Pharisees, a lawyer, comes up with his test question. 
it's important for us to recognize that this lawyer is considered a Pharisee of Pharisees. The fact that he is a lawyer means that he is an expert in the Hebrew law. And in this particular season of Jewish history, religious leaders like the Pharisees, like this lawyer, are hyper-concerned about following God's commands. They understand that their disobedience and their kind of ignoring of God's commands over generations is what led to the Babylonian captivity and the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel each being conquered. And so in an effort to rectify that, an effort towards repentance, they devoted themselves to the study and following of God's commands, and they created this elaborate system for doing so. They were identified in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, 613 commands that they tried to follow. 248 of these commands were positive, meaning they were things you were supposed to do. And the remaining 365 were negative, or things you were not supposed to do. So this Pharisee lawyer, who has studied and is an expert in all of these commands, crafts his question to test Jesus. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Of all the 613, which one is the greatest? That's how some translations put it. Which one is the greatest commandment? The lawyer is trying to get Jesus to pick just one of the commandments so that he can then trap him by saying, Jesus was teaching people to break all the others. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Of all the 613 commandments, Jesus boils it down to these two. Right? The lawyer asked for one, and Jesus did give him one, the greatest. But then he adds the second and elevates the second. As I was mulling over this passage this week, I had this picture come to mind. And sometimes it helps me to try to visualize uh, what something is saying. I'm a visual person. helps me understand it better. And so I pictured this circle, right? There's an image of that. And the first and great commandment, if you go one slide back, is love the Lord your God. And that is the great commandment that holds all of the other commandments. And then Jesus names the second commandment, and I imagine that is the second circle within the larger circle. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus calls the second one like the first. Everything about loving our neighbor is held within loving God. And all the commandments have their one shared focus of love, loving God and loving our neighbor. How we treat another human being is directly connected to how we love or we don't love God. And how we treat and relate with God is directly connected with how we love or don't love our neighbor. They are overlapping. All of God's commands are to be understood in this encircling of love, so to speak, right? In this context of love, with the assumption of love. This very simple but powerful response from Jesus left the lawyer speechless. He had no rebuttal to offer. If we ever have a question about what God wants for our lives, it is for us to love him with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, with our possessions, our time, our gifts, our talents, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's not complicated, though sometimes we do need wisdom and discernment about what love would mean in a given situation. But the focus is very clear. I've been so grateful for the gift it's been to live in my neighborhood and amongst my neighbors 
As I mentioned earlier, my husband and I were on the planting team of, of our former church. And because our neighborhood was a mixture of races and cultures, loving our neighbors meant intentionally building relationships with people coming from very different backgrounds than us. Early on in our church, there was a couple from Guatemala, Carlos and Patti, who had started coming to our Spanish worship service. And one day, they invited us over to their home for dinner. They had three elementary-aged children living at home, and later we learned they had two adult children as well. And over the course of the dinner, we were sharing back and forth, and we asked them their story of coming to this country from Guatemala. And they told us about their very hard decision to come. Carlos and Patti had gotten married when they were 18 and 17 years old, and the Lord blessed them with a baby right away. They were so happy together as a family, a young family, but they were also living during Guatemala's 36-year civil war. Like in so many other Latin American countries, the Guatemalan government was battling various leftist rebel groups. And in 2013, you know, many years after the Civil War had officially ended, the Guatemalan dictator was condemned for committing genocide against the indigenous Maya population during the Civil War and for widespread human rights violations. An estimated 200,000 Guatemalan civilians were killed in the 1980s and of those 200,000, 166,000 were the indigenous Maya people. At one point during the Civil War, things became so dire that our friends had no food to feed their son. Patti was afraid that he would become malnourished, and so they made the difficult decision to send Carlos to the US to seek asylum and to find work. Over time, he was able to start sending back a little bit of money back home to help feed their family. After a year or so, Patti then decided to join Carlos. He encouraged her to come to try to make that transition and get established. And so they had to leave their son at home in Guatemala with Patti's mother. They were hoping it was going to be a short time of separation, that Patti would get situated and settled soon, and that they would be able to bring their son to join them soon. But one year turned into two years, turned into three years, turned into five years before they were able to bring their son to join them in this country. As they shared their story, I remember feeling gripped by horror, imagining what it was like to be a young mother not able to feed your child. Our oldest was a toddler at the time, and I was brought to tears imagining him not having food to eat. It was heartbreaking to imagine our friends struggling to survive in the midst of a civil war, not having food to feed their family, being so desperate that they would leave their young child and to be separated for five years. Now that they were in this country, they were trying to honor the Lord through honest, hard work, Patti as a housekeeper and Carlos as a construction worker. The Lord eventually called Carlos to become our Spanish ministries pastor, and eventually both Carlos and Patti graduated from CHET, our denomination's training school for Spanish-speaking ministers here in Los Angeles, all the while working and doing ministry and raising their children. I am in awe of their faithfulness and perseverance through so many challenges. Carlos and Patti's story is so different from my own. I've never lived through civil war. I've never faced hunger or starvation. I've never immigrated to a new country to start over in life. There were so many differences between us, and yet so many points of connection. Their story reminded me of my parents' story. Both of my parents were born in a country in the midst of war, not Guatemala this time, but in China during World War II. Their families both fled to Taiwan when my parents were both five years old as young children. 
My grandmother's family narrowly escaped the Nanking massacre by the Japanese, and my mother's father escaped being sent to the concentration camps that the communists set up for those who were educated. I realized I was only one generation removed from Carlos and Patti's story. As we build relationships with our neighbors, loving them as ourselves means seeking out their stories, hearing their stories and their experiences of struggle, of difficulty, as well as of provision and joy. And as we hear their stories, we can look for points of connection. We can put ourselves in their shoes and imagine what it was like for them. Maybe for some of us, it's not your parents or your grandparents who came to this country. Maybe it was your great, 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 great grandparents or even beyond. Even with those differences, are there connection points with our neighbors' stories? Can we put ourselves in their shoes? I love how our denomination began as a fellowship of Swedish immigrants. And some of the Covenant's earliest ministry efforts included caring for new immigrants and sharing resources. The Covenant has this great little video that shows a, a snapshot of this Swedish immigrant history and how it connects with the, the denomination's current efforts to support Spanish-speaking pastors planting churches in immigrant Spanish communities, similar to Nueva Esperanza here. From one immigrant community to another. When God calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves, oftentimes that first step means putting ourselves in their shoes, looking for the shared places of connection in their stories, in our family stories. Who are the neighbors that God is calling you to love? And how can you put yourself in their shoes? There was a time once when Carlos and Patti let us know about some financial trouble that they had gotten into. They had built up some significant credit card debt over some years prior when Carlos was unable to find work. The recession had hit, and this was the late 2000s, and so there was no new construction happening in the city or the county, and so he had no work. And they used their credit card to get by. As credit card debt can often do, it ballooned over time and became a significant amount of debt. We prayed together with them and we asked them if we could invite other folks in the church to help. And the Lord was so gracious, we ended up being able to collect enough money to offer Carlos and Patti a no-interest loan in the full amount of their debt. They were able to pay off their credit card bill in full. And we told them that they could wait until Carlos was able to find work again before starting to do a slow repayment plan and, of course, with no interest added on. For our portion of the loan, we asked Patti if she might be willing to, to pay it off by coming and doing some periodic house cleaning for us. By that time, our second son had been born and our house was a mess. Um, some of you may, may or may not relate with that experience, but we were definitely in need of some help. And I remember Patti would come over and I would sometimes just feel so teary. I was so tired, but I was so grateful that she was there to help us. And even though I knew, you know, she was like paying off a loan, I felt so helped, <laughs> so blessed by her. After some months of them, you know, paying back the loan slowly over time, we took some time to pray, and we decided that we wanted to practice the Jubilee with Carlos and Patti. In Leviticus 25, God commanded his people that every seven Sabbath years, or every seven cycles of seven years, they were to practice the year of Jubilee. On that 50th year, the same sabbat um, sabbatical laws applied, so there was to be, you know, no farming of the land, the land was to rest. And Deuteronomy 15 also describes how in the sabbatical year, all debts were to be canceled. In addition to these, letting the land rest and canceling of debts, in the Jubilee year, all land 
was to be returned to the original tribes and families. Anyone who had had to sell their inheritance because of poverty, of financial trouble, they were to be given their land back. And with the return of land, people could regain their livelihoods. With the Sabbath year every seven years, and then the year of Jubilee every 50th year, God had designed a society where poverty would be eliminated. Resources would be set every seven years. Long-term generational poverty would never take hold. The longest poverty would extend was for seven years if you got into trouble within that first year after the last Sabbath year. It was a radical design by our radically good God who often reminded his people that they too were once foreigners in Egypt. They too were once slaves in an oppressive empire. Because of this, there was to be or long-term poverty in their midst. God called them to be different than the empires around them. Sadly, there are no records that the Israelites ever practiced either the Sabbath year or the year of Jubilee. But even though they never practiced it, doesn't mean that we can't practice the heart or the spirit of those celebrations. We might not have the same land inheritance as the Israelites had, but we have the resources that the Lord has given us. I can't remember how much of their loan Carlos and Patti had paid back, but I do know that the Lord had stirred us to cancel their debts. After some stretch of them faithfully, you know, making their repayments, we talked with the other families who had also given towards the loan, and together we decided that we would celebrate the Jubilee together. I can still remember sitting at our dining table together with Carlos and Patti. We had invited them over and told them, you know, we had some good news we wanted to share with them. And when we explained to them that we wanted to cancel their debts and we were going to celebrate the Jubilee together, they kept asking us questions to make sure they were understanding us correctly. You know, it's all that money that we're repaying. We don't have to repay. You know, it's gone. And we're like, it's gone. Yeah, the debt is gone. And when it fun finally sunk in, I think we were all in tears rejoicing God's goodness. What a huge burden that was lifted off their shoulders. If any of us here have ever been in credit card debt, we know the burden that that experience is, a very real burden. And what a blessing it was for our friends that they didn't have that debt snowballing and compounding. There was no way on their income of cleaning homes and of construction work that they were ever going to be able to catch up with that interest rate. And that debt would have been passed on to their children. But what I want us to know today is that blessing wasn't just for them, it was also for us. Practicing the Jubilee was a gift and a blessing for my husband and I. Just so you know, it's not like, you know, we are well off by any means. Uh, both of us have been in ministry our whole adult lives and have fundraised our salaries. We still fundraise to this day. And over the years, the Lord has always been gracious and provided for us. And he's taught us that what he has provided is not only for our needs, but for the needs of others. In that jubilee decision, God helped us to choose freedom from the love of money. It wasn't the first time that we made that choice. It wasn't the last time that we made that choice. Like so many things in Christian discipleship, right, you have to choose it over and over and over again. But it doesn't take long as you're reading the New Testament to see all the warnings about the love of money and greed, the danger of riches. These are second in number only two teachings about the kingdom. As Jesus taught us in Luke, we cannot serve two masters, God and mammon or money. We will either hate the one and love the other, or we will be devoted to the one and despise the other. So practicing the Jubilee with Carlos and Patti was a gift for us to choose freedom.
freedom to not worship money in our own lives. It was a chance to strengthen our faith muscles and to choose God over money. The Jubilee and so many others of God's commands, it's about both loving God and loving our neighbor. And over the years, certainly with Carlos and Patti, our neighbors have truly become our brother and our sister in Christ. As I was texting with them this week, you know, asking their permission to share this testimony, they wanted you all to know that they were praying for you and they were praying and hoping that the Lord would encourage you through this testimony. And Carlos is actually friends with Pastor Roberto here um, with your sister church. And so they send their love to all of you. Who are the neighbors God's calling you to love? How has he invited you to put yourself into their shoes? What are the commands from Scripture that you could practice to help you grow in faith and in freedom? Can you see how some of these commands are just as much about loving God as they are about loving your neighbor? Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for the blessing of these commands. Thank you that you give them to show us the life of joy and freedom and love that our lives were meant to be lived in. Help us to have eyes of faith to see the opportunities you're giving us to build relationships and form connections with people at work or on our street or in our schools. Help us to connect, Lord, with neighbors who are not only like us, but neighbors who also come from different walks of life. Lord, as we follow you in loving our neighbors, help us to experience more deeply your love for us in our lives. We love you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen.